Stafford is being chased, thrown on the run, and it is caught. Touchdown, Keenan Allen. What a grab. And that's what I'm talking about. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. That's the Warrior spirit right there, boy. Huge sack by Joey Bosa. 90 yard touchdown. 90 yard touchdown. That's going to be picked off at the 8 yard line by Derwin James. Herbert sets his feet, takes a shot downfield, has Knighton. Caught! Touchdown, Chargers! That's the greatest throw I've ever seen. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Thunder Down Under Chargers podcast for victory at number four on the season. I am Andy Prophet, your host, and joining me tonight, as usual, if People's Magazine shortlist Jason Kelsey is one of the sexiest men alive, all hope is not yet lost for this guy. Jack Reed! <laughs> and fresh off yet another physical injury sustained while watching the charges at the hands of yours truly, Alistair Lloyd. Two in a row, baby! Do you, want to tell us, do you want to tell us what happened and tell the listeners what happened this time? Yeah, so we, we sorted out the high five situation. We went fist bump from start to... There was a handshake at the start and then fist bumps throughout. That was all good. When <laughs> Joey Bosa got the strip sack and then the fumble, I've gone, yeah, with the double fist pump up in the air as Al's reached over to hug me or do something completely out of the handbook and I've punched him straight in the eye. So <laughs> I'm cheering away. Al's on the couch, curled up in a ball. Uh, yeah. I punched him in the face and another week, another bruise. Um, sorry, mate. We'll get the hang of it eventually, mate. The more wins, we'll perfect our celebrations. We need to buy another couch. That's for starters. Just get away from me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A bit of social distancing. Uh, real fun and interesting game to review tonight, guys, from Monday night. A big test ahead as we take a look at the Detroit Lions as well. All right, let's get into it. Los Angeles Chargers 27, New York Jets 6. It's said across the league you have to win in every kind of situation. Pretty football, ugly football. When your offense gives you 14 first downs and a tick over 200 total yards, gross, the defense and special teams has to step up. And boy, didn't they. Four forced fumbles, three recovered, eight sacks, no touchdowns allowed. 104 punt return yards for us with a long of 87 and a touchdown, if you don't mind. Offense still went two of two in the red zone and did enough to capitalize on helpful field positions. Record now sits at 500. Again, four and four, right in the midst of the far too early wildcard race. But wins against the uh, fellow AFC teams never hurt down the road. Um, there was a bit of nervous energy between Al and I watching. Uh, we just didn't know how we were going to go against this defense. How did you find the watch, Jack? Uh, I watched it with a dear friend of mine, uh, Matt Down. I know he will be listening to this, so shout out to the big Matty D. Yes, We Danny. were nervous up until maybe halfway through the third quarter, I think. There was elements of, we've got this big lead, what's going to happen? I was waiting for them to do something on offense, but they they kind of started to do something in the middle of that third and you got a little bit, oh, there's a Garrett Wilson completion, et cetera. Um, and their defense, boy, God, boy, I, that's the one of the best defenses I can remember watching in the last 10 years. But what was great is that our defense took it up to them as well and did not give them an inch. And the special teams was fantastic. We'll probably get onto the offense, but it was wonderful to finally watch a win where I felt like I didn't need to see Justin Herbert play turbo. There are a couple of moments he almost threw a pick and then there was that fumble where he was trying to do a little bit too much, but I'm very happy with Justin Herbert, the game manager, winning the game by three touchdowns. So very good. It's almost like, They've all listened to what you've been saying for weeks, Jack. Just play a bit loose. Just enjoy yourselves out there. Let's just see some fresh play. And since we last recorded All In, the, the most recent episode on the Chargers YouTube channels come out, uh, a lot of uh, it centered upon what went on internally after that loss to the Chiefs. And one hallmark was a real focus on having fun again. The team created a celebration committee on the defense where they could work on some <laughs> choreographed celebrations on turnovers. And it sounds a bit, you know, naff. And to us kind of people, you know, watching, we can turn, a, turn our nose up at it. But there still is something 
about this being a, a, a sport that you they played as kids and there's a lot of external pressure and the more they can jump about and fly around and support each other, it manifested into a beautiful performance on the field. So I thought it was great, Jack. It looked like they were all having fun. Uh, mm. Haven't seen the Staley defense have fun like that really since he took over, at least not many times, and that's two weeks in a row. So that was how we should start this conversation, I think. For sure. I'm not yet sold on the full team choreographed uh, celebrations, but I really am loving the Thule doing these ones and Bosa with the, the, the Tonga time. It's it's awesome to see the three of those guys, yeah, have fun, but also produce in the way that they did, um, really just <laughs> taking the piss uh, on that uh, Jets line. Joey Bosa, 91.1 PFF, six pressures, Three sacks, 42% win rate in true pass sets, like dominant. Khalil Mack, seven hurries and two sacks, and Thule, five hurries and two sacks. Like, it's just awesome to see all systems go and, and fire in the way that they are. They did. Do you, Al, do you think that there's still a concern about the interior of our, our D line? Oh, I'm not seeing as much as it for the last few weeks. I mean, they're, they're now officially seventh in the league in run defense, which is just outstanding giving up 3.7 yards per carry. Guys like SJD are probably playing as well as he has. I think getting getting in Tito was massive. That was as yeah. good a return to football for a guy who's played less than half a season of the sport. He came in strong. Fox is getting internal pass rush. So, look, all, all I can say is that front seven is the strength of the team at the moment. There's still a bit of work to do on the back end, which I'm sure we'll get into. But this was the second lowest score ever conceded by Brandon Staley defense. Their lowest was that game you remember last week against the Colts when Nick Foles was starting. That the yep. Colts only scored three in that game. But the two of the lowest three points conceded have occurred in the last two weeks. So things are going pretty well. It's definitely shaping up, isn't it? Uh, I think we're also seeing just far more consistent linebacker play as well. Um, Kenny Murray and Eric Kendricks just look great. Uh, such a, a great tandem uh, to to support from the secondary. The recognition from Kendricks. It looks like he's he's not doing anything, but you know he's the guy last off the the, the runner or the receiver um, in the in the tackle, and it's it's fantastic to see. Have we got uh, Earl Thomas back there? What's going on? This guy called Alohi Gilman is almost the barometer for the back end. And how well does our, I guess, Cam Chancellor and Derwin James play. He plays so much better when Alohi Gilman's out there. This guy made, you know, the, the front seven are doing what the front seven do. I mean, we're not seeing too much out of Michael Davis at the moment. We're not seeing too much out of Asante Samuel in the past couple of games. But Alohi Gilman just seems to make this whole back end tick um, and seems, when we talk about playing free, Alistair, it seems to be Derwin James is playing freer, but not as hard when Alohi Gilman is playing, less penalties, still making, you know, some extreme hits and tackles, but well within the rules and not being ejected. So Alo who would have thought that, you know, six, seven months ago, we were so gutted about losing Nazir Adderley, but Alohi Gilman, you know, from that interception that he had against the Browns last year has just gone from strength to strength and is now arguably one of the most important pieces of the defense that's not a big name. So good on you. Fucking Mate, awesome he stuff. Just, he, he just set the tone. Broken. He came out with that PBU on the game's first drive and in mm. the game's second drive, he forces a fumble. And then mm. later on, he picks up and recovers He's a always fumble around for 48 it. yards. He's always around it. It was Derwin so, James's best game for the season, in my opinion, as well. So I think you're 100% right. Him patrolling a little deeper allows Derwin to play with, maybe throw a bit more caution to the wind and just play on instincts. Yeah, on that, I did notice. I did sort of think that we played too high um, safeties and for most part of it. And Derwin was four to one free safety to in the box. So 10, 10 of his 50 odd snaps were, only 10 of them rather, were in the box. So, you know, maybe he's allowing himself a little bit more um, time to just see the field and see what's going on rather than sort of getting all hot and heavy up in there um, and being able to make some more sensible plays and sensible decisions. Still got Are we getting a bit one, excited but... about uh, a performance against Zach Wilson led <laughs> offense? Yeah, the, yeah. And Nathaniel Hackett yeah. pairing yeah. at OC. That's, that's the big question. Oh, I mean, to get 
to 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 do what you did on defense still ta- that's dominance right you know that's that's still i mean zach wilson yeah there's people come at me i mean I, I didn't think he's been that bad that was the worst i've seen him bar last week perhaps people were thinking that he can throw and 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 when he has the time and i must admit the nathaniel hackett offense does not help him whatsoever but we were dominant. It, it, as I said, it felt like everyone played their part. There wasn't Mac. We didn't need Mac having seven sacks. We didn't need Joey, um, Justin Herbert to pass the house down to get it. It just felt like a, like a sledgehammer does what it's supposed to do. It creates cracks and eventually the wall breaks. Not, not like a hammer, hammer, hammer. And then you kind of, eventually you've got a tiny hole. I think um, that was a sledgehammer of performances I saw from the defense, even if it's against the Jets. Um, as we have had. And we need those, right? You need those wins. Yeah, for sure. I was just really impressed. I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter who who you play against. Um, you just have to... It's just good to see the team executing on a high level and consistently across four quarters, especially... Well, I'm talking mainly about the defense, but um, yeah, to do that to Zach Wilson, real fun. Real fun. He makes some good throws, but he also just doesn't really have any idea how to play quarterback. So you take the uh, the result against the the victim, if you will, as it is, sure. But it's just good to see. Feels better internally. And and we have to credit the special teams as well. While the offense, uh, very shortly we'll get into the offensive woes, but while that's happening, isn't it timely to get this complimentary effort where we actually score a touchdown? on special teams to start the game. And wasn't that an exciting play, man? We, we've we been just monitoring it all off season. He looked good basically since the moment he arrived with the Chargers. Darius Davis, the kid just has a knack for finding the holes and he's gone. When he hits it, he's getting into oh, pay dirt. Yeah. And it wasn't just him either, was it? Like you could see the difference it makes when Dean Leonard's out there. He's recovered from his hammy now as that gunner. Um, Nick Neiman was tantalizingly close to a blocked punt. Mm, yeah. um, mm, and what about really, yep. what about old Dicker the kicker? Just send the fella out from fifty five, why oh. don't you? And he just slammed it. He slammed it straight through the guts. Yeah, it's a nice transition because there's a guy. I feel the Darius Davis thing obviously overshines the the start that special teams have. But Josiah Taylor, I thought had a good game defensively. Uh, but he and Dean Leonard on the first Jets punt absolutely smoked Xavier Gibson. And I feel like that's the kind of thing in that sort of e- ecosystem of the team, the special teams unit, uh, that is the kind of thing that fires them up and sort of gives them the, you know, the the goal to help, you know, make those blocks hang uh, when they're blocking for Darius Davis on his return. So just awesome to see all around. Um, yeah, Jack, I'm going to throw this one at you. Do you, do you think the the Chargers special teams plan is for JK Scott to just get as much hang time as possible. Or do you think he doesn't have the leg to sort of kick it further? Is there a concern that he'll outkick the coverage? What do you, do you see anything or do you think about anything like that? Oh, I guess it all do comes down to punters? technique, right? I was Well, funnily enough, sitting next to Mr. Down, I'll call him because there are students listening as well, is that we actually talked about, well, why don't punters actually, how hard is it to actually kick a drop punt and, you know, you're, it's a short field, so, you know, you want to try and get pin them back. How hard is it just to kick a drop punt like we do in AFL? You know, aim it at the 10, goes out at the 12, you're okay. But it seems so difficult. And I wonder if it's so much based on timing and technique and how their muscles are developed in their legs. We thought far too much about this. Mr. Down is a PE teacher, sort of sports science teacher, so we sort of got into the nitty-gritty. Serendipitous, you asked the question, Andy. So... I think J.K. Scott, before he came to the Chargers, was known as the best, one of the best hang time punters in the league, not necessarily one of the best legs. So like any good coach, you build the plan around what the talent is. And if the, ta- if the talent is the guy has a technique, whether like physiologically he's just got long levers um, and he can get the ball high in the air, why not build a t- why not build gunners that can get down there? Why not build, um, I guess, your tactics around a guy that's critical to that part of the game? So that's how, it, how I see it. Thanks. Good question. I prepared for that one. No worries. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just interesting to think because um, – yeah, we've just got a, a real ferocious special teams unit and mm. it's, it is it is working well. I'm not asking that question with any kind of 
Mm. Um, he's a good coach. For he's a very, very good coach, I reckon. He's a very good coach. Yeah, well, that's all it is, utilizing people to the best of their abilities. Uh, anything more on special teams before we get stuck into the offense? Al? No, nothing on the special teams, but why don't we dig into this offense, which, mm. look, some of those headline figures just... They make you pretty scared, don't 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 they? The Chargers average three point four yards per play. Oh. That's unheard of for the entire game. Herbert one hundred and thirty six passing yards in total, and it, at four point five yards per attempt. Yeah. So there wasn't too much to write home about. Uh, we couldn't really get things going on the ground. Um, where do you want to start, Jack? Was there anything that like particularly stood out that as as this this will not suffice? Well, let let me frame it like this. And I saw this uh, today. I was just flicking through my phone. Sixty two point eight, sixty one point four, sixty point seven, and fifty eight point four. Those are the f- quarterback ratings for Patrick Mahomes, the first one. Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts. So. Let's use that as a point of reference. I still don't think that it gives... Just so we're uh, clear, against against the Jets. You, against you the that. Jets, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I should say against that defense. Yeah. Um, it, that doesn't take Callum Moore off the hook, but that is a nasty, nasty defense and they came to play. So you've got to kind of temper any kind of analysis based on what they've done to arguably some of the best talent in the competition and some of the best teams in the competition. However... I am now beginning to really doubt the playbook that Kellen Moore has. And dare I say it, it's the adaptability that I absolutely chastised Lombardi for. When injuries started happening, things just sort of didn't really change. They kept on running the same concepts. They kept on doing the same thing and it's just not working. So that's where I am. Alistair, why can't we run the ball? I don't know. I don't know why we can't run the ball. One, so one might say because we're not giving the ball to the guy who's the better running back. Mm. How would you, how would you respond to that critique, Jack? That it should be Josh Kelly getting the carries and not Austin Eckler. Oh, I would say it's even on the broadcast. It's fairly clear to see that Josh Kelly runs very hard. Austin Eckler. I'm not saying doesn't run hard, but should be used in a completely different way. Um, and yes, he can. he's that little scat back and find the holes, but I think his longevity is more important. Just get some yards into Kelly, man. The guy's built for it. And regrettably, Coach Staley, who spoke for 30 minutes today at the press conference, if there's any sure sign that he's feeling a bit better about life, he spoke for 30 minutes today, which is his longest by a factor of about 20 minutes of the season. Um, Popper specifically asked about this kind of the way the usage of, of Eckler and um, Kelly has worked out. And he, he did unfortunately double down with this strat- view that Eckler is our bow cow. He, he's the back and you can expect to see more of how they've been deployed. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but he at least wasn't willing to commit to a change in that moment. Look, the pass protection just has to be better, boys. That That was the lowest or sorry the the highest pressure rate in a game that I've ever seen recorded on PFF according to them Herbert was pressured on 59.5% of his dropbacks 40 plus is considered untenable 45 above is like unheard of so credit to Herbert he he just does enough that he he understands what type of game it is because he's such a smart person he he kind of read the tea leaves in this one and knew that, look, what we can't do here is have like third down turnovers in a game where our defense is playing lights out against Zach Wilson. And there were some unlucky factors. Austin Eckler had three drops, which is uncharacteristic. Those, those they were, kind they were of, pretty bad as well. They mm. were bad ones. They changed momentum. They killed drives. Uh, but I, I agree with you, Jack. It was a bit um, disappointing to see that neither, I think it was neither Darius Davis nor, no, it was neither Guyton nor Parham had a catch for the game. And Andy, like how excited did we get on that play with Gerald Everett where he broke Mm -hmm. three to four tackles? Up to 17 or whatever it was, yeah. It was his last target for the game. Yeah. Uh, Well, I mean. Why? I've got no idea. I feel like it's it's no real surprise, but it, it is interesting that in those moments, um, where, you know, Herbert is getting pressured as much as he is. 14 of his 25 passing attempts were split between Eckler and Allen. And it's just like a safety blanket for him, I feel. Um, 
Interesting though, his time to throw was back up over three seconds. So he was extending drives and he was finding himself, you know, there was a few coverage sacks in there where they may not have even been. He just wasn't prepared to sort of get rid of it. And just Bryce Huff, Jermaine Johnson, uh, Williams as well, were just too fast and powerful for our offensive line. And it put them in uh, big strife. What's crazy about the, the percentage of... Uh, the pressure percentage of dropbacks is the Jets sent the blitz, I think, on about 10% of plays. And unbelievable pass rush. Unbelievable pass rush. They're getting home with three. They are getting home with three. And it's just, you know, the, the timing of some of those, uh, those defensive calls were great. Six of our eight drives that ended in a punt were three and out. So between the drops, untimely penalties, and a defense that was putting pressure on and getting sacks on first down, and sort of it made it really hard for us to, for the Chargers to sustain possession. And I think we were out of possession by, you know, eight minutes or something like that. Uh, lost the battle there. So he did a great job in the fact that we were still able to put up, what, 20 points on offense, barring the seven yards on special teams, seven well, points on special teams. I think I think the key was, and this to me was the key stat. Despite their woes with yardage, they actually finished seven out of sixteen on third down, despite their mm. struggles. And around that fifty percent mark is good. What they did was win enough of the moments, the kind of must-have it moments. I thought the field goal drive just before halftime was critical to take yep. that margin to fourteen points. Aggressive, love that. Yeah, that was great. And then they had that one extended drive that went from Q3 to Q4. And I went Crazy. back and rewatched on that drive. There was a third and eight conversion on a Herbert scramble, a third and nine deep curl to Quentin Johnston on the right sideline, th that third and four up tempo conversion to Keenan on the spot route. When I was calling out why we snapping the ball with 20 seconds left on the play mm, clock. That's right. That's why first new set of downs. And then that third and four freak catch to Keenan to take him over 10,000 career yards. What a great moment. And then when we scored a field goal on that drive, it's game over because there's nine minutes left to wear up by two scores. So the offense did just enough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Really made it count when they absolutely had to, but it just wasn't, it wasn't particularly good viewing. We're really riding the coattails of the defense, creating amazing opportunities, three turnovers, and then the offense, you know, kind of stuttering along and then, score from the two yard line when, uh, when Lowe runs it back and we managed to do enough. And Dicker was great as well. Sealing those, those stumble drives off. Hey, and a bit uh, of lady luck never hurts as well. We've got to just oh, remember, man. cause you can forget this. Everett fumbled the ball early that Davis recovered. Herbert strip sacked, recovered it. Whitehead drops an INT chance just before half time that Herbert tries to send his way. And then Darius Davis muffs a punt that, kind of falls our way so that looks like a very different game potentially if and also those like bounces don't go our way like darnell mooney the week before cj azuma sneezed the ball out of his own hands uh in the end zone completely untouched so yeah there was a fair bit of, of luck falling our way hey fortune sure. favors the choreographed celebration man that the lord mm. the football gods are liking what they're seeing and we're out there having a lot of fern yeah. um jack i got a question for you mate what are you seeing now that, I mean, some big news over the last 24 hours, 48 hours is that JC Jackson is not flying with the Patriots to Germany to play football this week. And there was an ESPN article that you shared with us mm. suggesting that Tom Telesco stood up in front of the room and apologized for giving him more opportunities than he deserved, which is an unusual step for a GM. Fair are you so. seeing, are you seeing any change to how the cornerbacks are playing without JC in the fray? Uh, I, I don't think the cornerbacks played a particularly good game on, on Monday night, just on the Tom Telesco standing up that does interest me because you do wonder, I mean, listen, for one thing, I don't think Tom would do that. if he's really caring about the position of his job and how, and how tenable it is. A bit of humility never hurts anyone. Tom Telesco, for me, never has 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 striked me as a particularly uh, has got humility to him. He's always a little bit content and quite sort of 
not smart ass, but um, he does tend to be quite content with whenever he gives us end of year press conferences. So I do wonder all these players that have played a lot in the past and we're going, why are these guys still getting a go when clearly they're not good enough? Why is Trey McKitty still on the roster after two years of really, really struggling? So you wonder how much sway there is on the coaches of the Chargers by GM and by Telesco and by perhaps Spanos is that, oh no, we picked him. So he's got to be good. He's got to be good. Anyway, that's just a, that's purely hypothetical. In terms of it's the cornerbacks. Impo- it's an important hypothetical though, just to quickly interject. Yeah. Because after weeks one and two, th- there's a lot of talk about, hey, why did Staley put JC Jackson in the game in week one uh, coming off that mm. injury? Arguably, that's the difference in the result of that game. It might even be the re- difference in the result of a Titans game. So it suddenly just creates conjecture around who's deciding the players that play and who don't. We don't know, but it's it matters. Yeah, it's a bizarre organizational pressure, you know, who's actually making the calls, you know, is, does Staley have, you know, 80% of the players he can do what he wants and 20% of the players who are draft picks, you know, you must play these guys because that's what's come from above. Uh, not a very good way to run an organization because normally you let the coach coach um, and you you give him the players that he wants and and um, and how to succeed. Second part or the, the second part of that is the, the, um, the cornerbacks. I thought perhaps they'd be, even, I mean, the grading is not great for PFF. Um, perhaps that's what led me first to say that they didn't have a great game. But when the front seven's doing what they do, um, I think they're okay. They're playing better. They don't look as confused. As you said, the defense is playing freer. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch the the coach's film, um, but you asked that, so you must be digging at something. What, what, what are you thinking? <laughs> oh, you know me too well. Buddy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got him. Uh, not, no, nothing deep because I actually, um, for transparency, I didn't get to the coach's film either this week. Sorry, listeners. We'll try to do t- hashtag TDU film another time. However, I, I just thought watching without even looking at the PFF grades that it was Michael one of Michael Davis's better games for the year. Then I went and checked the data and it suggested that he'd only allowed two catches on his seven targets for 14 yards. And I thought we saw a few more, like I know some were misthrows by Wilson, but it was at least in the hip pocket of Garrett mm. Wilson. And he had the old AK-47 out a few times for the game. So I like to see a bit more of that. It might not have been his um, best game, but he, he at least didn't put me to sleep watching him, um, even though my answer just got Jacker yawning over there on the <laughs> screen. So it's the, it's the time zone difference. Yes, absolutely. Half hour kills you. <laughs> but yes, room for improvement, man. It's like it, they are the weakest part of this uh, football team. As fans, we should almost accept it and, and kind of embrace that it's a front seven led outfit at the moment. And that's okay if you're getting precious sacks and forced fumbles and one interception due to pressure. Yeah, I agree. I feel like it's improving and I'm okay with that, with its steady growth. Would have been nice. I was saying to Al during the, the, te- the, the viewing, um, <clears throat> it would have been nice to keep Zach Wilson close to two, closer to 200 yards. Uh, but you know, it was valuable to get a couple of the, the backup guys in the game for the last sort of 15 snaps or so, give the starting guys a rest. And it was awesome to see that they played, you know, even with a three touchdown lead, they played right up until the end, forcing that stop on fourth down at the two and getting that tackle in. Like it was that was good. awesome to see. So it's good to, we're just sort of moving into a, like a group of guys that really enjoy playing for each other, uh, which is the chemistry and that's that's all important for sure anything further or should we do our awards alley boy yeah let's do our awards we we kind of talk about quentin johnston every week this one was kind of a step backwards but you know he'll have a chance against the lions um they don't have a source gardener replica so i'll be focusing on him more this week even though yep. he didn't perform on monday night football uh i think you might have the nah yeah award for I, this week i do and there's there's a lot to like from the defensive and kicking side of the ball uh, from this win. But, you know, Darius Davis, obviously a special mention. The three guys in, on the edge were fantastic. Uh, there was a special milestone, as Al touched on earlier. Keenan Allen, 10,000 yards. 
capped off with one of the most spectacular sideline catches you'll see and on third down of course so is he too old nah has he still got it yeah baby congratulations on 10k ka love it man one of my favorite all-time charges and it and sure. deserves all of the uh recognition he gets because he's a team first guy he really cares and leads from the front good on you keenan all right the negative award this week and negative. again yeah nah makes sense because i'm gonna say when this guy got drafted with pick 17 overall and you and i gave an almighty roar from your couch on draft night and wally was pretty ex pretty concerned next to us about why we're so excited that a guard was drafted mm. with pick 17. So here are some guys who get taken at pick 17. Oof. Jo Jonathan yeah. Allen for Washington, Derwin Oof. James, Dexter Lawrence, CD Lamb, Alex Leatherwood, Oof. Zion, Christian Gonzalez for the Pats. 17 is a kind of a slam dunk home run pick. And if you're going to use it on a guard, which is one of the lowest positional value spots, you're hoping for Quentin Nelson kind of generational returns fairly early in the career. I'm not completely out on Zion. This year at the moment, he's PFF's 49th ranked guard out of 80. Mm. And he just had his lowest graded game for the season, allowing six pressures and a sack with an overall grade of 42.8. So I was going to throw this award to him two weeks ago. We ended up cutting the segment and then look the opportunity presented himself. So I've got him in both barrels. Yeah, nah, come on Zion. You're a smart guy, Boston college. Let's have a good game against the lions. Cause we need it up front. That was a, was that as, 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 is that Boston, South Africa, Alistair? I'm not sure what that was, but it might have been um, Boston Hyderabad. I'm not sure. So, <laughs> oh gosh. All right. I guess that leaves my, my teachable moment. Now, we talk about sliding doors moments in life. And I talked last week about how grateful we should be as Chargers fans to move from Philip Rivers to Justin Herbert. Now, these are two fan bases. The Jets more so are probably far more maligned. They've got more supporters. They're a little more angsty when it comes to, you know, New York football. We love the Jets. Unfortunately, these guys, Justin Herbert and Zach Wilson, are separated by one year. One at pick number two. We can all remember the hoorah around Zach Wilson. How about he throws a pretty deep ball and he's pretty as well, like facially, and he likes to sleep with older women. No, that came later. But um, my Lord, how different, how different is it? I, you'd argue that if that's Zach Wilson's worst game, and that is Justin Herbert's worst game of his career, but that's what the numbers would suggest. And we still win by the margin that we do with a broken finger that had a bone sticking out of the end of it not that long ago. Maybe, just maybe Brandon Staley and this team are starting to turn it around a little bit. And we should just be, again, grateful because it easily could have been Zach Wilson at the charges. You just never know. We're one hypodermic needle away from utter failure. Class dismissed. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. All right. No worries. We move on to week 10. The Detroit Lions flying high at 6-2 and two atop the NFC North. But within the Chargers camp, the vibe is fun. Al pointed out and spoke about the directive from Derek Ansley to just enjoy your football a little bit more. Um... They've grown. Kendricks is loving playing with the team. He's been very vocal about that. The mood is up and about. Maybe it's helping the unit play some half-decent football. Who knows? But it's right down to the final minutes, as I said earlier, that the, the team wants to play through, and and it's it's great. Uh, Staley gave himself gave more time to the media, um, answered things in full without curse responses, but the roller coaster of win two, lose two, win two, well, lose two, thereabouts, uh, is getting tedious. So let's string on a third. Palmer still on IR is a touch concerning with the lack of where, with lack, lack of understanding from Staley as to whether or not we'll see Palmer again this year. And with Mike Williams already out, it's, it's a concern. Sprain, Andy. You're the doctor. Knee sprain. Uh, so what, what uh, might he have sprained? Not the ACL, right? PCL. Oh, 
four four plus ligaments in the in the knee. Who knows what a knee sprain is? Um, that's almost that almost kind of makes it worse that it's sort of undiagnosed. And he did go down looking like he was in a lot of oh, pain, yeah. but then he came back into the game. So it's a bit bit how's your father, if you ask me. Either way, it's not great when you're seeing drops from Jalen Guyton uh, and Palmer not getting the ball, as we spoke about. You know, our our receiving group is thin and. Uh, his Palmer's after last year became a pretty favorite target of Herbert. So we need some guys. We need some weapons. Uh, Lions had the bye last week, but they last played week eight against Las Vegas, winning 26, 14, a bit of a grubby game. If we're being honest, stumbling drives, field goals, turnovers, Lions weren't looking too flash as they have been for most of the season. Goff's pick six, nearing nearly leveling the scores in the third quarter, but it was sacks galore after that for Alex Anzalone and Alan McNeil. They tightened the screws and down the Raiders and Josh McDaniel's coaching mm. career. See you later. Enjoy that, Kev. Kev Diego's going to love McArse hat out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, genuine breakout game from Jameer Gibbs, early, early running back pick, 152 yards from 26 carries and a score. He tallied more total yards than the entire Raiders offense, and he looked fast and slippery. Uh, things to worry about for mine. As I said, sitting pretty top of the N- uh, NFC North, only losing to the Ravens in a blowout and the Seahawks in overtime early on. Al, over to you for their strengths. You guys know I can be a chronic over-preparer. I'm not going to go through this. I've got about two two pages of notes on their strengths. That's how how voluminous they are. So I'm going, to, I'm going to be selective. I could just go on for days about almost every aspect of their football team. Let's start with the fact that they've got basically the hottest young offensive mind in the game, or one of them mm-hmm. at the moment, Ben Johnson, 37 years old, graduated from North Carolina with a degree in mathematics and computer science, and it shows He's been a perfect marriage for Jared Goff. Having his best year, Jared Goff, his PFF's fourth ranked overall quarterback. What Goff is so good at doing is just off play action, hitting up throws over the middle. He throws a beautiful clean ball if you can get him some time in the pocket. They're going with quite a specific way of playing. His his PFF grade is 94 when kept clean and 52.7 under pressure. So what they're doing is he's got the league's third lowest turnover worthy play rate, the third lowest A dot, fifth quickest time to throw. So it's really just bang, ball, C, first progression, bang, hit it. And ben Johnson's mutt West Coast, isn't it? It's just more of, exactly. It's more of this just getting guys open who can create separation. And what that's led to is an offense that's second in total yards, eighth in points per game, and they're just flying I'll, I'll leave a few kind of individual piece players for you guys to wax about because there are some so there are some rookies we liked. There are oh. lots of those. I will just quickly refer to a couple of strengths on the defense as well um, before I throw it to both of you. Uh, they're eighth in the league for pressure rate, even though they blitz, blitz the fourth least frequently. So that is exactly what you want. Send four and get pressure. They're doing that with Aiden Hutchinson, who has the second most pressures in the NFL. And also Aleem McNeil, an underrated Mm. defensive tackle from NC State. Thank you very much, Tao. 20 pressures and four sacks for him, and he really stood out to me, Andy, in that that Raiders matchup. Yeah. They're third down defense. They're ranked third in the NFL. So they're just strengths all over both sides of the ball, any specific guys that either of you want to throw a shout out to Jack? Yep. I reckon this is the best line in football as well. You talk about Jared Goff, not going under pressure, uh, not being under pressure and having a 94 P a 94 uh, PFF rating. It's because of Decker, Jackson, Ragnar, Glasgow, and Sewell, Justin Herbert's mate. So um, would the triple headed monster please stand up against these? Uh, this is yet yeah, one of the top, three lines in football. Uh, I love them. I love watching them play. I just love Dan Campbell. I love the the way the Lions go about their football and what he has done to that franchise to reinvent what Detroit Lions football is. Uh, and one of my favorite players to watch in the slot, I think he's Keenan Allen, second coming. That's Amon Ra St. Brown as well. He's going to be very, very difficult to stop if he gets on a roll. Andy, yeah, anything from you? Just before you jump in, Andy, uh, Jack, what do you think our learning is? Because 
We had a bit of a laugh when Dan Campbell was first hired with that introductory presser and the kneecap biting knee stuff. Cap, yeah. What 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 have you learned to kind of from the whole experience that he's ended up being a good coach? I believe that that was not a gimmick. I tr that is Dan Campbell mm. being true to form. And if that upsets you or makes you feel, and you just laugh at him, think he's a bit of a maniac, so what? But if you get the support of a front office and an ownership behind someone like that, who is so intense and obviously clearly driven and has them and has the ability to get his players on side by, listen, he might not be the most eloquent, which he is, mind you, he's, yeah. you know, he's, he's not a, he's not a dummy by any stretch, no. but um, he can walk the walk and talk the talk. And if you're talking about a guy that wants to bite your kneecaps off, this football team plays like it. Um, uh, because he's done it and he's gone and, and, and he's gone and played. And so he can expect that level. Very interesting. If Brandon Staley walked down and said, I'm going to bite your kneecaps off. Come on. Uh, that's, that was a bit of someone else, but that's okay. Uh, yeah. He's a uh, LAPD <laughs> cop, right? Or Possibly. Yeah. Turns out to be the killer. <laughs> Turns out to yeah. be the killer. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think like, it, I think authenticity yeah. is the key it doesn't matter who you are but players will sniff you out if they detect a fraud and actually i think that's part of staley's appeal as well he is who he is and i don't think he puts on any false sense of bravado i think he's honest to the core and and who he is as a person and i think dan campbell is exactly the same way yeah he's like the definitive leader and inspirer of men isn't he and i feel like johnson's the perfect foil both offensive minds and Johnson's the guy who pulls out all this trickeration with how he designs his blocking patterns and stuff like that. I watched a 20 minute video earlier in the year on how he designs these trap blocks and the pulls and pushes. And it's just, he's, he's a wizard. And Dan Campbell is, he walks the walk. He says all this stuff, this rah-rah stuff, but he'll be, he'll be the guy getting involved in the, the training and doing the push-ups oh, and the I'd love burpees. to play for and him. How does good that would you stuff? feel about yourself if he pumped you up and like smacked you on the chest? You'd feel like a million yeah. bucks playing for Dan Campbell. Yeah, I'll spend three weeks in a hospital even just trying to put on the pats. Like, God damn, I'll run through a wall for that guy. We laughed, you're right. We laughed our heads off, but it was, he's absolutely the perfect fit for the blue-collar Detroit Lions. And that's all he wants is rugged football but actually like committing to the bit um all right so we've pumped up the lines a bunch jack have you got any ways to try and bring them down um well the, the three things that that i have and as much as dan campbell might we, we've just pumped him up there have been some rumblings from the detroit lions fans about how jameer gibbs has been used throughout the year and the fact that Montgomery has taken a bunch of snaps early and, you know, we spent a first round, high first round pick on this guy, what's going to happen? Unfortunately, against the Raiders, it seems to be that either Dan Campbell's listened to those or Ben Johnson's listened to those or he's just decided that it's now time to unleash Jameer Gibbs. Um, well, let's hope that maybe there's some slight shadow of doubt around who's going to take the running back position. That's as that's very ephemeral and nebulous as a as, as a as a negative, but um, Jared Goff, lesson we've talked about how good he is. I don't, I still don't think he's a game winner. He's a game manager and he plays well when he's, as Alistair pointed out correctly, when he's clean, but when he's not, that's what happens. We've seen it in LA. Um, we do see it when it comes down to it in the crunch with Detroit. The last one I'll say before I pass over to you two is um, the cornerbacks are not strong either but when you've got a front seven doing what they do they don't necessarily need to be superstars um sutton and jacobs there and i think who plays their slot that is uh oh brian branch who i thought was injured okay. and out for the year given the uh given the injury i saw from him a couple of years ago he's, he's dead. dead but uh but brian <laughs> branch is doing okay so that they're really the only weaknesses and i did have a fourth hash mark there saying they're the detroit lions but i think they've shaking that monkey off their back. I think they're a really good football team. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a precious few. Uh, I just found one odd one. I don't know how, it could just be kind of st statistical variance or luck, but for some <laughs> reason they've been really bad in the red zone on both sides of the ball. They're 21st in the red area on offense and they're 27th on defense. 
and conversely, we're the fourth ranked red zone offense. So if we can get the ball inside their 20 and vice versa, maybe we can keep them out of the end zone and maybe we can get in there. It's one of those sneaky little weaknesses of theirs. Yep. Uh, not too much. But look, I mean, not too much further from me, but I think as far as the weaknesses go and the keys to victory is take away what you can from the Ravens' effort. Um, you know, they got to go off a bunch, five sacks, and forced the errors and got a lead and put them under pressure. And he's, he does kind of panic, Jack. You, you hit the nail on the head. He's, he's a game manager and a, and a system quarterback. And Ben Johnson has, you know, now spent, is he, what, a year and a half into his time with Goff and he's worked him out because he's a, he's a wizard. Uh, so if we can, um, yeah, just get to him early. You know, if the defense can show up like it did last week, then we're really in with a shot because it is possible. Now, I'm not saying that our defense uh, rivals the Ravens, but played good football on the weekend. So it's possible. It's all possible. And fuck's sake, Derwin James, just cover Sam Laporta in the red zone. Please, brother. Yep. Because uh, we didn't mention the rated rooks, but Sam Laporta and Jameer Gibbs, Jack Campbell as well, like, not crap. Um, they were an interesting kind of early coup for the Lions. We sort of going, okay, rah, rah coach. And now they're picking Jameer Gibbs at 12. Like, fuck, but hey, uh, good players. And they're, they're doing all right. You know, they're in in the hunt for the, the number one seed of the NFC. Um, it's all possible, but it's all possible for the Chargers as well. Uh, any further ideas on how the Chargers might get the W this weekend, fellas? Yeah. I, I, so what I'm looking for in this one, I, I think this is this is the most important game of Brandon Staley's career. How many times Isn't that every week, mate? How many times are you yeah. going to say that? Hey, it's Groundhog times? Day. <laughs> I'll tell you why. He's facing his reflective self three years ago. He's facing the genius wonderkind late thirties hotshot coordinator who's running the best system in the league on the other side of the ball. Brandon Staley's defense is coming over back, coming off back to back wins against backup quarterbacks, but the defense is playing with heat. We all watch, we all listen to the podcast series, the play callers um, produced by the athletic. And we know that when Brandon Staley was hired by Sean McVay, it was specifically because McVay and the Rams had had troubles facing the, the Fangio defense when the Bears beat them and when Belichick stole that game plan for the Super Bowl. And Garrett, Jared Goff had a lot of trouble with pre and post snap identification of safeties. And McVay said, you know what, we'll get in Brandon Staley who runs that defense and we'll try to work on Jared Goff's strength. Sorry, on his weakness and make it a strength. Staley spent all of that year with him. And now, with our team sitting at four and four, he has a chance to come up against the hotshot offensive coordinator with the quarterback he spent a year with. And fans will look at this and judge Staley. If the Lions come out and score 35 points, 40 points, and obliterate us, it will say a lot, I think, about... Staley's bona fides as a future head coach and the future direction of this football team. That's my. That's how I'm going to view this game. What they can do, we've spoken about it a bit, but you've got to throw off their timing because of how quickly Goff wants to get the ball out of his hands. He's the ninth least pressured quarterback in the NFL. So we've got to just somehow stop that first read, play some bracket coverage on Eamon Ra St. Brown and early in the game, stop the run because that's what they'll try to do early. They love to work off that play action pass. It's jo Goff's magic medicine. Find something, Brandon Staley. I believe in you. This is your chance to shine. Take us to five and four. I'm going to go straight in my prediction mode. I think the Chargers get the win. I'm going to go Chargers 27, Lions 21, and we're going to be five and four with the defense putting in a good performance at home against the Lions. Jack, what do you say? This is it. Last two wins have been against backup quarterbacks. Do it against one of the best in the league. Do it against one of the best lines in the league. Joey Bosa, you're at full health. Khalil Mack, you're playing well. Tuli Tuli Pelotu, you're playing well. Eric Kendricks, you're playing well. Kenneth Murray, Derwin James, Alohi Gilman, 
There's no one on the injury report. There's no one other than Justin Herbert's finger. And we know Josh Palmer's out. This is, you got to get it done. I'm not so bullish. I think the Lions put up 34 points. The Chargers put up 27 and we go four and five. Okay. I'm boyishly optimistic too. Chargers win 31 to 28. Uh, I feel like both offenses will have a little bit, a little bit going on, uh, but I feel like we're going to write it in. So two and one for the TDU boys this week. And guys, just before we head off for the evening with Jack's change of job and change of state living, he's going to be taking a little bit of a break from TDU. So if you do tune in for Jack's teachable moments, we'll do our best to replicate the wisdom and uh, nuance of the man that we love and we'll miss for however long he needs off. But uh, he'll be back at some point. I will be back. I will be back. uh, We wish you all the best going forward with you know, all the changes in your life. So got our full support, mate. We will see you soon. And guys, thanks very much for tuning into TDU. Let's hope for victory pod number five next week. We'll see you then. Catch ya. Bye. Good night to all!